Welcome everyone to this AMSO lecture. We are very happy to have Abhijit Banerjee with us today. Abhijit is a Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics at MIT. He is a co-founder of JPAL, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. And he received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2019 with Esther Duflo and Michael Kramer for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. Abhijit's work has had a profound impact on the practice of economics and on the practice of policy. At the beginning of his career, Abhijit was a theorist. He notably proposed the beautiful model of herd behavior. But at some point, he started doing RCTs, randomized control trials. His work and the work of many others helped economics mature into an experimental science. Behavioral economists brought in vitro testing into economics with lab experiments, but with RCTs, Abhijit and others brought in vivo testing into economics. And RCTs are a great way to provide concrete answers to concrete questions, such as how to help children learn better or how to reduce deaths from malaria. Now, there was originally some resistance against RCTs in the profession, but I think more and more economists have realized that yes, RCTs can be combined with theory. They're actually great for, for structural estimation. Yes, RCTs can account for spillovers and equilibrium effects. And yes, RCTs can be used to answer big questions, such as whether poverty traps are real. Now, RCTs are a great tool, but they are not the only one. And in their latest book, Good Economics for Hard Times, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo leverage research from all over economics to help address our main social problems. This book was written before COVID. Times were hard then, while well, they are certainly harder now. And we need good economics more than ever to address the challenges of the post-COVID world. Uh, <clears throat> a few words on organization. Abhijit's lecture will be followed by a discussion by Robert Aziparo from the Ex-Marseille School of Economics. We should have some time at the end for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please write it in the Q&A. And uh, that's it, Abhijit. We are very happy to have you with us. You have the floor for an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I figured that in the context of what's happening in, in today's world, um, there, there is obvious reason to be interested in healthcare, and in particular to in the question of delivery of healthcare, um, not just uh, the not just, of course, the the um, you know the the technology of healthcare, but also on how the healthcare gets delivered. Who, for example, um, you know. How do you get people to get vaccinated? And that's a question in which trust and efficiency are immediate in a sense. So I, when I say trust and efficiency in the market for healthcare in low-income countries, you'll see reverberations of the ideas here uh, across the world. It's, this is, uh, I should say, um, joint work with Jishnu Das, Jeff Hammer, Reshma Hosam, and Akash Mopal. And it's, uh, in a sense, a confluence of several strands of work. One very important strand, which will be the very important, the first part of it is work that Jishnu has done for the last 20 years on measuring uh, quality of healthcare uh, in developing countries. Um, it's really, and related work that I did with Angus Deaton and Esther in also 20 years ago. So there is work on measurement and I will spend quite a long time talking about just measurement before I come to any, any interpretation. I'll tell you what, what some facts are and why it's sometimes challenging to, to even document those facts and what, what makes those facts maybe more striking than Mm, you you know I we, we expected when we started out and then I'll 
suggest an interpretation of the fact, just a suggested interpretation. I won't claim that this is what's exactly happening, but it has a, the advantage that it sort of ties together the facts with some notions about trust and efficiency. And then I'll show you a little bit of evidence from, from uh, an RCT, which we had done on trying to improve, well, which tried to improve both trust and efficiency, and you'll see what it did and didn't. And finally, I'll tell you a little bit about why maybe this is uh, relevant for questions of policy. I think a lot of healthcare, I think the background here is uh, useful, which is that um, healthcare, when you think of healthcare in, in France or in, in the US or in UK, there are different models, but in each of them, uh, I think the key ingredients are um, insurance, um, various, you know, pricing of pricing of services, but, and while there is a market, for example, for these services in many countries, it's, it's not typically a market for fee for service. So it's, it's, you know, most of it is already paid for in one form or the other by the state or by individuals. Um, very little of it is you like buying, like buying, a, you know, a, a, a repair of your, of your uh, car, which, which is an even less uh, like um, buying um, an apple. So it's very little of it is, is, a, is like go, or getting a haircut. I think to take, the, take, the, take a, an example that is very close in some sense, getting a haircut is not at all, in France, it's not at all like getting healthcare. And I think that, analogy is misleading when you think of most of the developing world where getting healthcare is very much like getting a haircut. You, you, there are multiple providers and even in very remote areas, multiple pro providers, I'll give you some numbers. The qualifications of those providers vary a lot and there is no presumption, for example, that they have medical degree any kind. Um, <clears throat> the insurance essentially plays no role in any of this. This is primary care. There's not that there is no insurance in these markets, but because partly of the difficulty of regulating markets where you know there are many, many participants and there is free entry essentially, people can come and claim to be a healthcare provider, insurance systems <laughs> don't want to tackle primary care. They, they, insurance does provide secondary and tertiary care in many of these markets, but not primary care, or at least partially provides secondary and tertiary care, not primary care. Um, and as a result, this is, I mean, the market is effectively out of both the regulation by the state and regulation by you know, uh, HMOs and other pri private provi providers. So there's really, uh, people set their own prices and get whatever quantity they get. And, you know, the incentives are provided directly by the market. So in that sense, this, is, this, this, this world is perhaps, as I said, much more like the world, world of getting a, health, a haircut than that of getting healthcare in France. Think of it much more like a head. We, as I said, we'll start by showing you data. And the data comes from a large number of studies, all of which uh, Jishnu Das was involved in, some of which I was involved with, etc. cetera, um, from uh, five locations in India, but also from China and Kenya. And the important uh, word in that slide is standardized patient. Standardized patients are essentially actors trained to play the role of a patient. The reason you'll see that that makes a very, very big difference uh, to everything um, that we can find, we find. So it's, it is very important to understand what they are 
they're really trained and trained by a kind of a set of a combination of of, of health experts, but also very much uh, acting experts to be um, to claim to have certain conditions. So what you do is you show up at the provider claiming to have certain conditions. You can easily see that that limits all in all kinds of ways what we can do. For example, if you say you've broken your leg, it's very implausible. You can't claim to have broken your leg. Um, and, you know, and therefore, uh, therefore, uh, there is, um, you know, you, 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 can, you can claim to have a cuff, you can claim to, but even that's a little bit hard sometimes if you, you, you can't cuff at all during the, but there's a range from, you can't have a runny nose, for example, runny nose is easy to observe. So there, there's a very clear limitation to this. On the other hand, it does have the advantage of, of having A being validated in the sense that you can connect this to you know, other things that these practitioners do. Uh, I don't want to go into the validation exercises, but also to, uh, to potential concerns about are these being taken seriously? Is it the case that the, the practitioners just see that these guys are fake and therefore don't behave in the same way as they would otherwise. And so there is an attempt to validate that. I won't tell you details of that here because I'll take that. Those, those are whole papers which are then, um, then uh, you know, try many different approaches to this validation. But and the second advantage is if you believe the validation, then it has the big advantage that it's it's really what they do rather than what they say they will do. And that's a lot of the healthcare literature has relied on what people say they will do as against what they will actually do. And you'll see that that makes a big difference. I sort of said this, so let me, um, but still summarize that there is uh, a key fact that I think I'm going to uh, show you is that the quality of care is, is very low. And I don't think you will disagree with that. And highly variable. Sometimes it's better than others. However, it's almost always inside the envelope of what we think the providers, we, what we know the providers know. So when you ask them how you will treat the same condition, they say <coughs> X and what they do is usually Y. And that's, that wedge is what is going to be of interest to us. Um, and then well, I'll, I'll come back to the rest of this. Let me continue. This is uh, the idea that we need to, um, that there might be inefficiency in healthcare markets is not new. There's, you know, in a sense, it goes back to Arrow 1963. So it's, it's a very hallowed tradition in economics. The healthcare markets will not necessarily deliver the right outcomes. Um, and, you know, for example, there is a large literature, both arguing theoretically and empirically, uh, that there is uh, the, that that there is, that patient patients, especially in insured settings, have very little incentive to to monitor, um, you know, whether they're getting the right thing or not. In the sense that, as long as they're getting the right thing, if they're getting more than that there is no reason for them to push back. So, and that gives, this, creates incentives for healthcare providers to over-treat. And that's sort of the, the core concern in a lot of the literature from the OECD is that, which is that there will be over-treatment. We will find the opposite, we'll clearly find evidence of 
under treatment. Um, now, that's uh, related, as you, we will argue, to this other fact where on which there is more recent, a bunch of recent papers suggesting that, you know, uh, that the patient, patients are often, mm, they lack trust in healthcare providers. And um, a, a very nice paper is, this is misspelled, is Alsan 2018, uh, which shows that uh, in the uh, wake of the Tuskegee ex experiments, uh, the African-Americans had uh, just became, once they were revealed that these experiments had happened, they stopped trusting the healthcare system and not, not getting you know, necessary checkups and, and prevention. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really beautiful paper showing that African-Americans in the US were underusing healthcare because they were actually suspicious of the motives of the doctors. And so that, that's going to be a key part of our story as well. So um, there is there are papers which focus on the lack of trust aspect of it, um, and then there's a bigger literature on on just mistakes that providers make. Um, for example, uh, Mulanathan over Mayer is a nice paper. Um, this is a so what we're going to talk about, uh, as I said, is the effect of trust, the, the lack of trust in providers on the practice of healthcare. So what do the, how do you respond if you're a provider, if you know that your patients are suspicious of you? Arrow uh, talks about something very related. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, it's, it, it says that the physician cannot act or appear to act that, uh, so as if he is maximizing his income at every point of time. He has to signal his intentions uh, to the buyer. So, and that signaling question is going to be key to uh, our the the model I'm going to get to it in a, in a bit. So that, keep that in mind, that what we are interested in is, there is a literature on now on lack of trust. We want to look at what lack of trust does on the supply side. Uh, let me come, to, so I'm going to start with the facts now. Um, so these are some maybe striking and maybe Im implausibly dramatic facts in a sense, 80%, of contacts are with free for free for service private sector. This I told you already. Seventy-two percent of providers in rural areas have no medical degree. Eighteen percent of some medical degree, but not an MD degree. And four percent have an MD degree. This is not because these are places where there's no one. There's typically a bunch with, with no degree in every village in, in various parts of India. Public providers are more qualified and offer free service, but they have a 20% market share. Um, where there is actually a public health center, it's much higher, but people don't travel even to the next village to, to get public health care. And the reasons for this are interesting and important to discuss. They are uh, part of what we discuss in uh, our work with uh, Angus and, and Esther, but it's, this, this is not what I'm gonna talk about today. But those are sort of just different locations across India. Now this, this, this is, this is uh, uh, across India, you can see the, graphic, so the green is no degree. And you can see that essentially, uh, other than Kerala, where, where essentially everybody has a degree, almost everywhere else, uh, no degree is the, is the standard. Okay. 
the data. The data comes, as I said, primarily from these, uh, well, this comes from two things. One is these standardized patient visits. Um, so two or three standardized patients typically will visit a healthcare provider. These are different locations, so different, slightly different protocols. And we will say, for example, I woke up this morning and have feel a crushing chest pain and was feeling very anxious. That's your absolute, you know, uh, somebody, a, a healthcare provider would, in France will probably recognize immediately as a, as a sign of uh, impending heart attack or actual ongoing heart attack and would suggest that you take an aspirin and go to a hospital immediately. That's, that's your, the treatment protocol. So then you, know, you show up, they, he, the provider does whatever it does, he recommends a treatment. Um, they, 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 I, as I said, they, there is no evidence that you know, the provider uh, think that the patient is faking it. To make sure of that, we don't send multiple of these patients to the healthcare provider at the same time, because then given, especially that there's very few visitors, he would wonder why there are so many outsiders coming. But it's not, on the other hand, it's not unknown for outsiders to come to them because you come with a story which says, I was visiting a friend, a relative, uh, uh, um, you know, my uncle, and I I'm feeling very sick. And can you can can you take a look? He suggested that you come see me, or I, I or um, I was visiting a friend, and he, he, I I came to see you. So there is there's a cover story that's given given in all of this, uh, which uh, which is um, important to to make it credible. It also means that. Uh, the, these are uh, typically people who are, so in, 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 in this, in, in this uh, uh, data, uh, the variation is going to be limited because in two ways, one is that we try very much not to, some, something we could have done differently is we could have varied the patients and provided signals about, you know, the ability to pay. We don't do any of that because we really, we don't want to attract any attention to these people. So we minimize that, which is maybe right, maybe wrong. Um, but it means that we, we are going to, everybody tries to look the same. They're, they're given the tr same training and, um, they are, uh, and uh, they, and the second thing is the, uh, what I said already, their conditions are very much limited by this. They, you cannot claim that you broke a leg. Once this is done, and this takes a while for the reason I said, which is you don't want to send a bunch of strangers to on the same day. So the strangers have to be spaced out over a month or so two to, to make sure that Essentially, you know, the, the provider thinks, okay, fine, you know, one more person in a month who uh, I haven't met, that's, that's okay. If four of them showed up in two days, I would start worrying that something strange has happened. Um, and then after this is done, two surveyors visit the same provider and do what is typically done in such cases to look at their ability to treat, which is to complete a medical vignette. This is the standard procedure. One surveyor, one says, surveyor two will be your patient. You should treat him like a real patient. And then they say exactly what the standardized patient said. But in this case, it's known that they are pretending. Just, just to, uh, so that's a very different setting potentially. These are the samples we'll talk about. Some places there's both public and private. Some places there are uh, 
uh, in China, it's only public. In many places, it's only private. Uh, they're rural and urban. Uh, some are, I think in all cases, there's trained and untrained, except in West Bengal, where uh, the RCT was carried out and the focus of the RCT was on untrained providers. Therefore, uh, therefore, there was no, there was an attempt to keep them uh, to ch choose people who were go who needed training. So therefore, that there's uh, is only untrained, but typically there's variation in training among these people. And then there are three conditions: typically, asthma, diarrhea, angina, TB. These are these are. Uh, are the conditions that typically show up, each of which, uh, yeah. Now, we're going to show, I show you, before I show you data, let me tell you a little bit of the measure. The correct treatment for angina is take aspirin, get an ECG. We will be, because in some sense, um, you know, the, the, you know, you, we, Already, as I said, incorrect treatment is so predominant, we take a relatively lax definition of correct. So at least one element of A and nothing else. Okay, so you, if, as long as you are named something as correct, that's good enough. I, uh, this, uh, this avoids, for example, issues about, you know, I, I could, I could um, you know, I, I, you know, I, maybe I, I think that uh, you have, you know, it's, this something is very expensive and therefore I don't, I endogenize your demand at some level. So this, this is, um, tries to be bare minimum rather than if there were three different medicines and one was less important than the other, then um, I, we're, we, as long as you name one of them, that's, that might still be okay. So it's, it's taking a, a specific and relatively conservative view of, or, of, of being incorrect. Um, Over-treatment is you get the right thing and something wrong. And incorrect treatment is you name nothing in the right list. And we got the right list by triangulating um, kind of doctors at Harvard Medical School and in, in Delhi, um, in the and in China, the the, the kind of the, the capital, the uh, healthcare experts in each of these areas. So that that's that, that's where the uh, list comes from. Um, as you can see, the core fact is that incorrect treatment is overwhelming. Kenya, which is a, you know. The ur urban Nairobi has maybe less than 50% treatment. Everywhere else is over 60%, typically uh, or closer to 70 and 80 or 80%. Um, and uh, a lot of that is giving an antibiotic. I think the, the one piece of uh, incorrect tre over treatment is a lot of the overtreatment is actually giving an antibiotic. Um, a lot of the incorrect treatment is also giving an antibiotic. So bo in both cases, you get a lot more antibiotics than you should. Uh, and that's a separate issue in itself. Antibiotic resistance um, uh, is uh, rising, has risen. And this, this is a part of the reason is that you know, there's absolutely uh, uh, abuse of antibiotics. So that's, 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 uh, I'll show you a little bit more, uh, you know, this is, this is less of, uh, you know, here the, there are slightly different choices are made. So when you, you want to look at the cost implications of this, uh, just to see whether or not the, you know, 
how how important is the incorrect or over treatment if is it just that you know i don't suggest anything to you or is it the case that i actually make you spend money so if i say don't don't do anything go home and rest that would be incorrect treatment in our definition even though in boston whenever i go to my doctor that's what they always say so that would be um incorrect treatment but it would be incorrect treatment that would be free uh and we are going to uh, count so here what we're trying to do is look at whether or not this the uh, the treatment is uh so typically in every visit by the way all the idea that I will do nothing is almost never practiced they give you something often an antibiotic so that's that so it's not but and now what i want to do is just define make some definitions if you give something that's needed then the full cost of the visit is treated as necessary if you give something that's unnecessary but something is needed then just the marginal cost of the additional thing is counted as as unnecessary and then if you don't do anything useful then the whole cost of the visit is treated as uh, use use uh, useless and uh, you can see uh, you know the example given suggests that th there is a lot of a lot of uh, you know uh, kind of margin of error in this in particular uh you can you if you for example to give a child if the doctor takes the view that we will just do trash first try something if it doesn't work we'll do something else that's going to uh that that you know this 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 could be um, this could be actually correct treatment we we'll treat it as over treatment but it's not going to be necessary over treatment sometimes the cough syrup is useless but is useless only because exposed he was given the antibiotics so in that sense it's it's less useless you know if if it may work ex exandi it could have worked and if it worked then that would be treated as as being the right treatment so that conceptually it's not obvious how to do this correctly just to give you some orders of magnitude again between 70 and 90% of the expenses are avoidable according to our calculation so there's a lot of waste in this system you know most of the money is wasted um it's also high for qualified private providers by the way so this is there's some data on and in the public sector the public sector has a lower but not extreme much lower and you can see that even for qualified providers that number can be as high as 40 or 50% so it's not not necessarily just unqualified provider now the next question so that's just to say that there's a lot of incorrect treatment next question is is this due to lack of knowledge and uh uh obvious thing we can do is we can see because we ask them what would you do in such a situation we can compare that we can say you said you uh, you know we we don't actually do this to the person but conceptually what we're doing is you said you you should do a b and c you do c and d uh, or do you do you know how much of a b and c when you say you do it do you do you do and that's obviously the question of is how much of this is fixable by just making people more you know training them better giving them more knowledge and in, and so what we can do both uh, this sort of look look at uh the correlation between what you say and what you do and we can also see if in particular if you happen to know a lot do you do a lot less 
uh, of the useless things. Uh, is it the case that the performance in particular is the bad performance is concentrated among untrained people and more trained people do much better? We already saw that you know, even trained people do pretty badly, but at, uh, <coughs> at least we can look at this more specifically. So this is what we call the no-do gap. No is what you know, do is what you do. No is what you say in the vignette, do is what you say, do to the standardized patient for the same condition always. And you can see that there's always a gap. The gap is often very large. So you might know, know the correct answer 70% of the time, but do it only 25% of the time. And that's true in all the data sets we have. And it varies a bit by private. And there's no sign here. You can see that the most trained people are actually the, for example, the private trained people are among the worst offenders in this. They do very little of what they know. They know, they know more than others, but they don't correspondingly increase what they do. The other thing you can do is, is then, uh, then run a regression. Um, so let me skip this one. This is, this is, this is a, a four-way classification, which is uh, correct. Uh, you say the right thing, but do the wrong thing, and the other way around. Uh, I mean, I, this, is, this confirms the same, same fact. Uh, but and go, go to this, which is run a regression, where you, what you do is you put what you do on the left-hand side and what, <clears throat> what you know on the right-hand side. This is just a correlation, but it's a correlation that allows us to estimate theta, which is uh, the effect of increased knowledge and in better performance. <clears throat> now, the one problem with no is that people are often you know, they forget one thing when they say it. So no is often poorly measured. Um, so what we can do is we can use the, uh, use the fact that um, there is, we have multiple measures uh, of no. We, we, have, we, we do the, this particular uh, measurement of no twice, that allows us to have a, a, an instrument for, you know, one, one measure of no can be an instrument for the other. The concern here is that because no and do are both binary variables or almost binary variables, the, the standard IV tends to be uh, upward biased. So what we do is then we put a little more structure on it and estimate uh, this by GMM. And then we can apply the same measure of measurement error to other samples and see what that they would imply. So we can try to correct for, um, for that in other samples. Um, and you can see that basically a reasonable coefficient from the GMM, let me assume that the GMM is the right one. 20% of your increase in, in, uh, increase in performance is in knowledge is turned into performance. So something like a coefficient of 0 0.2, 0 0.0, maybe 0 0.3, but no more than that. Your knowledge goes up by a lot more than your performance goes up. That's bad news in some obvious way. There's no, uh, you know, a lot of the spending is unnecessary and training doesn't seem to help a lot. I mean, it helps, but not enough maybe. The obvious question now is, is there reward for extra effort? Maybe these people are just doing the optimal thing because nobody is going to pay them uh, for the extra effort. And, I want to, us to look at look into that for, first more naively and then maybe through a lens of a model. So what 
What we are going to show you is uh, data on <coughs> three outcomes and the price. And the price includes uh, your entire um, uh, the entire package. We can do it in different ways again. So typically, the healthcare provider actually gives the medicine. He doesn't actually write a prescription, he hands the medicine. Partly he buys them in bulk, gets them cheaper. Partly his prescriptions are worthless. So you're not actually, so he buys it on the black market or some other gray market and sells them because he's not actually allowed to write prescriptions. So, the, uh, so he buys the medicine on gray markets and sells them. So in either case, uh, so typically we should just include everything he does uh, in what you pay, but you can do it differently. You can leave out medicine. Then this, this is this is a there. I won't spend too much time on it, but you know, Jishnu has a set of papers on which he tries to do it in multiple different ways. Um, so the only thing this should be self-explanatory, except for the maybe now in the U.S. there is a very strong emphasis on checkies that you know you you should when you treat somebody you should just check off all the things you that you need to do so we could ask did you ask those questions did you do those exams so there is a specific set of checklist uh, steps for each of these uh, conditions and i'm going to you reuse the uh, in the case of the uh, standardized patients we know how many they complete and we can see what price they charge. So the, I'm going to do this in multiple different ways. So if you uh, you know if you think that the first thing that you see is not quite what you would like to see, wait. Um, so this is the relationship between examination time and checklist. So if you examine longer, you complete more of the check checklist. There's no, there's no no. Uh, particular uh, surprise there, nor is there a surprise that if you complete the checklist, then the treatment is more likely to be correct. So both of those, these are just correlations. You may, you may uh, worry that you know the people who complete the checklist are also more likely to be, you know, more uh, serious, and all of those are true. So there's nothing, no particular causal claim being made here, but it, is, it seems like the market is behaving, uh, you know, there's nothing here that jumps out as suggesting a reason why, uh, you know, you shouldn't do your work. So it's, there's, you know, if you do your work, it seems like you get better outcomes, whether that's causal or not, uh, I, I, I don't know. Likewise, if you do work longer, you get paid more, and you check do more of a checklist, you paid more. These are all different locations. Each curve is a different location. You can see the fees checklist relationship is uh, once you standardize the fees to to a, a standard deviation of the fees, uh, they are a, strictly on top of each other. They're all going exactly the same direction. Surprisingly uh, uniform uh, relationship between checklist completion and fees. So now, why do I show you this? Because I want to make the claim that checklist completion is a observable. You know, you can see how much time he's spending. At least the time is observable. So if I'm a patient, I can see that the person's putting more effort, is doing more checks. Maybe I don't know exactly whether the right checks or not, but I can see that he's spending more time. And I seem to be willing to pay more for it. Whether that's, again, this may not be causal. It may be that these are people, with very different people, but nonetheless, uh, so I come back to the causal question in a second. This is, there's not much variation across people who know, uh, 
no uh, more uh, they don't the relationship between checklist completion and correct treatment is roughly the same if you if the checklist is is you know exactly if you say the right things do you do much 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 better no you do somewhat better uh, and again this wide variation in it you can see that uh, uh, some people who know a lot uh, the they, we are comparing people who know and know for sure so people who say you know give the right answer in both the times they were asked the question uh, those people don't do much better than the ones who say to give the right answer once so it's not the case that somehow knowledge and there is and the, there's enough variation so you can see that some people who know a lot do very little some people who know a lot, little or relatively little do a lot etc so it's not totally um, just knowledge driven so in the in those curves maybe just to emphasize the 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 kind of bell shaped curve is the distribution of the you know the fraction of population who complete certain amount of the checklist on the right hand side is the is the uh, that's on the that's that's on the right hand scale. On the left hand scale is any correct treatment, and you can see that there is when you do correct treatment, you get more. It doesn't matter so much. Uh, you when you do more checklists, you get more correct treatment. Doesn't matter whether how much you know, and there is variation, large variation among people or how much they do. And that's that's what you should keep in mind. Um, This is um, now. Now I'm. I'm. I. This is with um, fixed effects. Okay, so you might be worried about the two places where we have um, multiple uh, multiple uh, observations on uh, on the on the same for the same provider for the same same condition uh, the provider when the same provider does more which happens maybe the provider has a uh, looks at the patient and thinks the patient is richer or whatever they charge more as well so when you do more you get paid more and you get better outcomes so it's not it, the there is a there's very at least prima facie, there seems to be incentives. So if you do more, you get paid more. Um, when we do the hedonic regressions, you know, time, all this is confirmed. The checklist completion is, uh, if you complete more, you get a higher price. You spend more time, you get a higher price. You can do more correct treatment, you get a higher price. Uh, any of those are correlated with, so the price is, the market seems to have exactly the features you would expect, which is, you know, better pro provision is rewarded. Um, the fixed effect regressions are next, and the fixed effect regressions are exactly like the uh, the cross sectional regression. So it's not because this is we are comparing apples with oranges. If I keep put the fixed effect, this what I'm doing here is I'm superposing the fixed effect with uh, and the non-fixed effect, the cross-sectional regressions. And you can see that the they look non-parametrically the same. It's not just that they have when you estimate two clouds, you get different uh, the same you know coefficients. This is really they look very very similar. There's no, you can't. You have to squint to see differences between them. So it's not the case that this is a result. So in some sense, the same person doing more is uh, is gives you when he does more, he gets paid more. So it's not the case that I have a fixed price uh, for my uh, whatever whatever I do, I get ten, and uh, whatever 
uh, Yan does he get 15? And therefore, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, when you do the cross-sectional comparison, you get a coefficient. This is when Yan does 10 and Yan does 15, he gets more when he does 15. And the slope is identical. <laughs> there seems to be a price per hour, if you like, or minute, which is standardized. And those who do more, I mean, when I do more, I get paid more. And there seems to be little variation. I, uh, let me not try to spend time on, on this, uh, but you can see that at least this is, this is, this, this is outcome price charge uh, is increasing with, uh, in both of these samples now with fixed effects uh, and without fixed effects. You can see the coefficients are extremely similar uh, and uh, you, it, it makes, you can do different ways of estimating it. Really very little makes a difference. So it, it's the case that uh, you do get paid more if you do more. Um, now one reason, so that says that if I were to do more, I would get paid more. Or at least it looks very much like that. Why don't they? One reason could be that they're busy. They're just treating patients all the time. And maybe the, the, it's more desirable that they treat more patients than just uh, take their time. So here's a, in these two locations, we also look at how much time they spend a day. So the peak in Birbhum is 30 minutes a day. And the peak in Madhya Pradesh is 50. 15 minutes a day, and they, they typically spend whole day in their office. We had, during the vignettes, we had people sitting in their office all day. So it just doesn't seem to be the case. So in other words, if you estimate, now it could be the psychological cost. It doesn't have to be, maybe every time I treat a patient, I'm exhausted. Um, it should still be the what it so I can't rule it out, but <laughs> the implicit wage to not do any more would be six dollars per hour. In in uh, in these locations, the roughly the earnings are close to minimum wage, and minimum wage is three dollars per day, so six six dollars per hour, they are in the office six to eight hours uh, versus three dollars a day. That's what they're making. So if you wanted to say that they are, you know, what, what is the wage that, what is the marginal cost of time at which they would not do it? That would be six dollars a day. What are they getting paid? Three dollars and uh, six dollars an hour. What are they getting paid? They're getting paid three dollars a day. So it doesn't seem close. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but it doesn't seem anywhere to square this circle. Okay, so now um, what I want to do is, as promised, I'll, 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 I'll tell you a little bit about, about uh, a model which would at least be consistent with these facts. And then, then, um, and then, uh, then show you a, some results for our city. So the, the motivation for the model is a quote from an anthropologist who says these things. So I'll quote, just read a part of it. A patient straight away, if, if I tell a patient straight away that they have to go to get tests that cost 10,000 rupees, he will run away and not come back. So I give them some medicines and tell them to come after three days. Then I slowly ask them to get the test done. So in other words, building a reputation, that's, that's a clear statement about building a reputation. I, if I do something that has some ameliorative effect, even though it doesn't make it better, and so on. Um, so I'm going to try to show you a little model of that, two types of providers, two healthcare conditions, mild and serious. Mild conditions have a lower cost of not being treated. 
you have two levels of effort. If you do the first level of effort, then you will only diagnose if the condition is mild. If it's not, you won't be able to diagnose it. any of them. Uh, if it is, so there could be many different mild conditions, many different serious conditions. If I do uh, 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 the more or higher effort, then I'll be able to diagnose both. Diagnoses are, can be, you know, only correct with some probability. Uh, and if you put in a cost of effort, uh, you pay that cost. Um, the high type is high, defined to be the one that's more likely to correctly diagnose. And directly diagnose, I'm going to equate to correct treatment. It, since everything is noisy here, it really makes no difference to the analysis. I could put another stage of noise to, by having treatment in it, but nothing. Effort is observable, but type is not. The patient lives for two, two periods and has symptoms of disease in both. That, of course, is just definition of period. The, the discount factor is all that's connecting those periods. So uh, the disease can be of either type. The patient doesn't know. Um, and he has always an op outside option of taking V-bar, which is going to the hospital some distance away. That's more costly, but maybe it has a, a, a some predictable outcome. The second period, they have a choice of visiting the same person, visiting a different one, or taking the outside option. The difference between the periods comes from the fact that the patient observes the provider's treatment and whether it was successful or not. So did it do something good or not? And then you can decide that, you know, uh, it, I, I go back to the person either with a different condition or maybe a recurrence of the same condition, et cetera. The contracts are key. They are fee-for-service contracts. In other words, you can only be paid when they deliver service. You cannot say that, okay, you reveal your type and I will pay you a fixed amount, and then I won't go to you. I, or you know, if you reveal yourself to be a low type, I won't visit you, but you still get paid. Those are not ruled out, and that's key. So, and the decision is exposed. There's no commitment. So if you reveal yourself to a low type, I cannot commit to coming to you, come to you. I'm just going to walk away and go, go to someone else. So zero commitment uh, and uh, no payment for without service. You, you know, the, the, the provider's condition on the contract on the past experience potentially, and based on, their, on that and on their own type, they provide a contract which has a claim potentially of their own type, a proposed effort level and a fee. So I, I suggest in this period, I will treat you for 10 minutes and I'll charge you five, 50 rupees. And I'm a, I'm a high type doctor. Anybody can say that, it's, but yeah. That's so, um, you know, the patient minimizes the cost of being sick, less the cost of fees, plus the, the cost of fees, and uh, the pro, there's some discounting potentially so that it might maybe a long time before she comes back. The provider maximizes fees, less cost of effort. The, I'm going to assume, make some assumptions to make the model just less cases is all very easy to analyze. Randomly selected providers only worth seeing for a low effort task. So if, it, if I don't have any prior information, a known high type is worth a high effort visit and a no low, low type is worse than the outside option. So if, I, if you declare yourself a low type, I'm gonna to go to, uh, to the hospital or go to some other person. The basic structure is that of a signaling game, but with the signaling game, uh, remember that here there's two periods and there's no commitment here. So, you know, I can, I can try to signal um, my type. Uh, I, I cannot be paid unless the patient comes to me. 
this is what limits the scope for separating equilibrium. Typically, we, we think of signaling games, especially I'm going to use a particular refinement. Uh, you would think that that picks, those tend to pick separating equilibria. Here it's going to pick pooling equilibria. Uh, we're going to apply divinity uh, just because I like the name. Otherwise, we could apply choke creps, uh, uh, et cetera. We could, nothing particularly different will happen. I, I, I'm going to not go through so much of the details, but you, you see exactly how I use it in a minute. Um, the, the second period, the two types of identical payoffs, because they are both going to, nobody's going, you're going to be paid at that point of service, whether you get better or not. This will, will turn out to have the consequence that only a pulling outcome is possible in the second period because the if the low type reveals his type he gets zero so he will never want to reveal his type uh, uh, and so as a result there will be the high type there could be partial separation but if there were partial separation then the then there will be an incentive you still get paid what the low type gets paid in a partially separated equilibrium the high type will pay, get paid zero as well like the low type but if you're getting paid zero you're always better off uh, of moving to a, a pooling equilibrium which will satisfy divinity because both types have exactly the same incentive to move to uh, the pooling equilibrium therefore there is only pooling equilibria possible that pins down what happens in the second period we given that we can now analyze the first period which is again there is a some possibility of separation now and there, there can be separating equilibria the way this it will separate is you'll say i'm going to lose money in the first period but that then buys me credibility because if i were a high type uh, i'm more likely to cure you and you probably won't come back if you're not cured but if you're not cured you you are you will think i'm worse than the average type and therefore I, you are going to go to just someone else there's no reason to come back to somebody who's failed to cure you so uh in, in so if it is the case you know that's not that's, uh, that's not quite right but think of that as being the 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 extreme limiting condition is that you know i if i if i uh the only way we're going to get separation is if it is the case that the you know the high type is more likely to be employed in the second period that's what gives him the incentive to be to separate he will therefore charge a very low fee in the first period and say I, I will make it up in the second period. You'll go, you're going to come back and you're going to then pay me the market, you know, the market, the equilibrium price, but that's going to be enough. If, if I were a low type, I wouldn't charge you this price because if I charge you this price, you would then, in any case, I probably won't be able to cure you, so you'll never come back. So I'll lose money in this period and then I would not be. So separation is possible, but perfect separation is not because in this, given the structure of the model, if there's perfect separation, then there's no updating from failing to cure. I, you, I know already you're a high type. You fail to cure me, there's some chance I would, you would fail. But therefore, I don't update on your type if you fail to cure. But if, since I don't update on your, uh, on, on your type, it must be the case that both types earn, earn the same amount because the L type could do just like the H type, but that means again that this, this is, this is, this is uh, um, so full separation is never going to be possible. There could be partially separating equilibria for the way as I described it, where you lose money in the first period to gain money in the second period, but you do, do it only to the extent that there is, you know, there is an, enough, um, you know, and there's enough, uh, it's not, there's still enough uncertainty about your type. So that's why it has to be partial. Um, full pooling is an equilibrium, satisfies divinity. There will be no way because, uh, you know, any, any, any deviation from that, uh, you, especially 
the full pooling equilibrium where you extract the full surplus in the pooling outcome in both periods is an equilibrium always. There might be partially separating equilibria, but the, the full pooling equilibrium is often the paratodominant. So I'm going to, that's the argument that you will actually see pooling in this world and not be surprised. There's no reason to expect. Uh, this means that the pooling equilibrium has the feature that the H tag will choose a low action in period one. This pool, you're pooling. Since you're pooling, nobody, the patient will not pay you if you choose a high action. Uh, you won't get paid enough. So you're going to choose a, you know, both types will choose a low action. Um, the patient will be too suspicious of you. If there's a successful cure in the period one, then patient will return in period two and you provide a high action and a higher fee. So we will see uh, variation quality across providers, but also within providers. I will treat somebody new differently from somebody who is old or somebody who seems to trust me differently. If there was variation in trust uh, differently, um, higher actions will be associated with higher fees. Uh, the no do, do grab. If over time, I'm going to treat you, uh, the con there'll be convergence in efficiency because, you know, as I my build my trust, I've always been successful in curing you. You think I'm a good guy. What I say is going to be more, I'll respect it more. Um, the selection of providers over time. So, you know, Efficiency does go up, even though there's pooling always. Finally, a positive shock to the reputation of a provider can improve performance. If I suddenly realize that you are actually a good guy. Now, this is an experiment, and the experiment is not perfect mapply mapped to this, but it's, it's an experiment where randomly chosen providers were given nine months of training for um, over yeah, a, a lot of training. Um, this, uh, we have a paper in science where we show that this increased correct treatment by 8% eight, eight um, given that only half, them, uh, half of them attended. The IV is uh, probably a better measure of the scale, 13 13% increase in correct treatment. Um, <clears throat> we now, one thing I want to show you is that uh, this is, so the, you know, this, this is what I just said, which is that you, you get, um, you get higher um, time spent, checklist, higher correct treatment, higher time, time spent. Um, you also get higher fees, but it's never quite significant. Uh, though I'll show you, say, tell you something which makes it more, more closer to significant in a bit. Um, now, why, would, why should the training impact treatment? One is that could, there could be knowledge gains. And I, I won't have the time to show you this, but there is no knowledge gain. The treatment doesn't change knowledge. Then we were changing the perception of knowledge gain, gain. Maybe even the providers are more confident. They believe that they have gained knowledge. I can't rule that out. But remember, it, or they could be that they have soft skills that, um, that also are improved. So they, they might be, or they might just be more principled. I have to do this. I don't, I'm, all of those would suggest that we would uh, see an in, so those would be supply side changes or they could be demand side changes and demand side changes could either come from the patient thinking that uh, this guy, he went to the doctor, he must, the training, he must be better. It, may, it doesn't have to be true to be important. Or sec second, it could be that um, just the fact that he completed a training is suggesting that he's better because he's more committed, and we do see evidence of that. So the only uh, I'll show you that there is no effect 
this tiny effect on checklist, uh, knowledge of the checklist, no effect on correct treatment um, in, as measured, me, measured in vignettes. So this is the vignettes given to the same people. Um, and you can see that the, the red line is the fit of you know, the mapping from baseline knowledge to attendance. And the more you attend, uh, you know, the more you, the better people are more likely to attend. So you could treat it as a signal saying, look, he went to the tr training, he must be a good guy. And you would be right in thinking about that. So there are, um, and the impact is concentrated as consistent with the previous one, all the impact comes from, from them. And this is also true. Now the price effects are also more likely to, closer to being significant. So the price also goes up for the same reason. Um, going back to the two sets of explanations, it could be that there's a sh this, the sh higher treatment and prices are either because uh, the supplier is producing more uh, and um, at the same cost to him. So he's He's just at uh, the time, at the same amount of time, he's being able to produce more. So you would then, you would get higher treatment and prices, but the relationship would just be shifted up. Or the whole, the treatment, the, the mapping from treatment to prices would be um, then shifted up uh, or, uh, so shift it down, or you would see movement along the same price um, price production function. So you could see, and this would be happen if there's just a shift in demand. The, there's no effect on supply. If there's an effect on supply, the supply expands, the relationship between effort and price should go down. I should charge you less for the same amount of effort because effort is cheaper for me. In that case, you would see an effect on quantity or potentially at least because the quantity would go up. The price, of course, then would could go probably go down, but maybe we don't see it. Um, the alternative is that there's a demand side shift that the people are actually saying, look, I want more from you. So in that case, the relationship between effort and price doesn't change. We move along that relationship. We now, I offer you the same pair of uh, choices, but you say, I'll take a higher price, higher effort. So quantities go up because demand has shifted. When reputation is the driver, this, would do, this is what we should expect. So what I want to show you is this, which is that there is, no shift in the relationship between checklist completed and treatment. So there doesn't seem to be any evidence of a supply shift. You're just moving the treatment and the control are exactly on top of each other. But overall treatment does better, why? Because the points on the right are picked out. The demand seems to have shifted. that's fees and checklist. There's no difference in, it's not that the checklist completion is coming cheaper, it's the coming at the same price, but now you are willing to take it more. The buyers seem to be more willing to take it. So skip all, all this. Uh, I've got 30 seconds left, so let me finish. Um, so, I, I guess I just summarize this, which is that reputational theory is consistent with these prices. But then what this is suggesting is what, what do you do in a situation where reputation is a constraint? Uh, you, well, one, one problem is that, you know, that the, the Medical policymakers in India just want all these doctors gone, except that they provide 80% of healthcare. So if they're gone, God knows what's going to happen. So they just want to eliminate them. Now that seems both wrong for you know, the fact that there would be no one left. 
And second, because uh, even the private, the trained private sector doesn't seem to do much better than these people. So if you want to live with these unqualified providers, um, lack of training is a problem, but probably not the biggest problem because they don't do what they know. What, what seems more important is some form of certification. So to help people build reputation, give them tests, give them and publish that. So make it, uh, give them certificates they can show so that people can actually, um, actually, uh, you know, follow, uh, uh, you know, to the, go to the patients and say, look, I have a certificate, trust me, I'll get it right. So I think this seems like a market where certification could have a major role. It's not what right now the policymakers are keen to do. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and uh, I guess um, I'll wait for Roberta's comments and then questions. Thank you very much, Abhijit, for, for being here and for this very interesting talk. Uh, let me also thank my colleague for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. This is a presentation that has been prepared with the joint with some colleagues here. And before digging into the comments, I have a few, so stick to that. Let me just give uh, a brief uh, uh, contextualization uh, uh, of the issue of poor health in uh, low income countries. Uh, and so if you think about one of the figure that is uh, the most striking, think about like a, a expectancy at birth, even in 2019, you have uh, almost a uh, 20 year of gap between uh, the uh, most poor countries and the, uh, the richest country in the, in the developed world. Uh, and so mortality rates are still very different between poor and rich countries. And poor health is not only about mortality, but it's also about being uh, in poor health during your entire life. And being poor health implies that you suffer about uh, from condition that can be very um, uh, damaging in terms of your ability to produce income and so may imply a strong uh, 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 poverty along your entire life and so poverty drops. And the, the entire research <laughs> agenda of uh, Abhijit uh, and Esther uh, in the last decades uh, have been helping in providing an explanation of why people are in poor health. Uh, and there has been a lot of research doing by the, the development community uh, that try to understand whether is due, this is due to lack of uh, appropriate uh, medicines or lack of uh, appropriate uh, um, uh, uh, vaccination, lack of infrastructure, lack of trained professionals, and all that is true. But there has also been a, a lot of work to try uh, to improve over that. But even though uh, those improvements uh, have been going on more and more, uh, there is a, another dimension that is the dimension that has been highlighted uh, by the paper today, uh, that is the fact that you also have poor governance. And that even though you may have trained professionals, uh, or those professionals are not there uh, providing the, the right amount of effort to actually have help patients. And so the, the, the line of research uh, and the entire research program that has been presented today is very important because it has been the first to first document uh, the universe of provider, providers of healthcare in uh, low income countries. It has documented the fact that you have a low, a lot of low uh, uh, qualified uh, practitioners and that those uh, practitioners are especially there in uh, rural settings where uh, people may start uh, building issues of trust and but also on top of that the fact that there is the consensus of this uh, no do gap that seems to be extremely important and uh, even though uh, knowledge has been uh, has seemed to be uh, going up over time. Uh, if you compare the work of uh, the co-author of Abhijit Das uh, 10 years ago, uh, knowledge was around uh, 40%, uh, the prevalence of knowledge was around 40% in, uh, in similar sample in Delhi. Uh, the fact that knowledge goes up doesn't imply that uh, uh, good practices go up, go, goes up. And so uh, trust seems to be a key issue in context in which you have such a huge prevalence uh, of uh, undertrained uh, professionals. 
And so I have a two, two set of comments today for, for Abhijit. The first one relates to the explanation of trust. So I, I, of course, given the setting, I definitely believe uh, that trust is an issue. However, when you think about the context, uh, the first thing I would think about why people are reluctant to increase the time they spend with patients is because time they spend with patients is correlated with, with price and if people are poor and so and liquidity constraint they may just not be able to increase the price and i know that you have fixed effect relations in which you show that practitioner actually increase the time and they increase the price but that could be just due to reverse causality they increase the price when they can do that but when they cannot they just keep doing what they what they do uh, then there is the issue of competition, and you showed us this very striking uh, figure about people spending on average like 30 minutes uh, of their uh, time in clinics with patients. The question, this is re really out of curiosity, what do these uh, practitioners do? Could you explain us what their job? Because what you say to us is that basically they spend their time at a very low wage rate doing nothing. Um, and one explanation could be that maybe even they would like to do more, especially in rural areas, there are physical barriers to be able to uh, provide better, better, uh, better care. Maybe uh, when they need to shift to a more expensive uh, level of care, uh, the, the, uh, the, equipment you, the equipment you need to do that is just not present in rural areas. And so maybe it would be interesting uh, if you could provide us some uh, discussion scripty statistic about the difference between uh, lines related to primary care medicines that it's not expensive and uh, lines related to higher higher levels of care uh, like for example the equipment of uh, linked to ACG uh, for angina uh, another comment I had related to uh, more your theoretical framework is uh, also the fact that for your uh, lack of separating equilibrium and your parity efficiency in pooling, uh, these two uh, time, uh, two period models seems to be uh, kind of key um, in the sense that if you have a longer time horizon and you don't uh, 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 this kind of time too much, then you may be willing to stay uh, in a relationship in, uh, with, a pa with patients in which you separate. Think about about uh, doctors in, in, in villages when they, they keep interacting with their patients uh, and through social networks as well, so reputation issues are there. Uh, maybe at the, at the, in the long run, it's just more efficient for uh, high quality doctors to separate themselves. So why actually the fact of uh, actually separation doesn't happen in, in reality, especially if uh, even in, uh, uh, when, when doctors put low level of effort, the fact of being high quality implies a higher probability of you giving a better treatment at one point your patient and should realize that you are not good enough. Uh, the last point related to the trust explanation uh, of this gap is the way you measure the gap. Uh, so vignettes have been known in develop, uh, developed countries uh, to provide uh, uh, underestimation of knowledge in the sense that doctors in developed countries, uh, they put less effort in vignettes than uh, with actual patients. And so I was wondering what are the incentive of those doctors in uh, developing countries in India to put more effort when they are tested rather than uh, when they are uh, with the patients. And then the second set, and I'll try to, uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have almost to conclude, but I have uh, some other question on the way you test the model. And I think this is important because I think uh, the way you test trust is very smart. Uh, you train people, uh, you give a signal, and this is very coherent with the senior literature about education. You give a signal of the fact that they are better. And this, this is fine, that's what you want to do. But uh, then as you mentioned at the end, another way uh, that you could have tested that is to manipulate trust through certification uh, to through other way uh, 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 of signaling the fact that people are uh, of high trust, uh, for example, making the training more visible. And I think that would be needed to validate your test because uh, another explanation of the uh, reason for which training is effective is the fact that you modify motivation uh, or the awareness of doctors of the fact that uh, bad treatment uh, has very serious consequences. And so why didn't you randomize also on the visibility or on the certification to, to actually test the, the trust? 
uh, dimension. Uh, another way to, to randomize trust would have been to have a treatment in which you have referral for a friend, from a friend that have been uh, shown to be uh, actually very trustable in uh, developing country setting. Uh, and then <laughs> this is really out of uh, trying to understand the model. Uh, the asset option play a key role. Imagine that the asset option instead of being hospital is the fact of being poor. So at, the, at, at one point you run away just because you, 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 you cannot pay for the treatment. It, Providing uh, income transfers to, to poor people could solve the issues uh, and, and could uh, lead to more separation. And finally, a very few issues in which I would like you to comment if you have time, otherwise uh, no matter about, uh, don't bother about this. The first one is, uh, could you discuss about uh, the non-economic implication of bad treatment? Uh, the uh, health implications are massive and you didn't discuss that. Uh, then the human capital implication of all these, the, if you cannot uh, gain your day out of uh, doing good medical care, why should, edu edu why should you educate? I, I know that there are Careers in education because the the uh, the, the the supply uh, of education is limited in rural areas, but yeah, I'm more interested on the, the uh, demand side. And then a few words on uh, universal healthcare um, that basically would make the price uh, of a medication less visible. Uh, you mentioned issue in developing countries about uh, monitoring from the patient point of view, but this could somehow solve a trust issue if. Uh, in, in, in the settings you described. And then what is, uh, uh, finally, what are the implications for the COVID crisis? Uh, how much these trust issues matter the way India is suffering today uh, in, during the pandemic? And I'm done. Thank you very much. This is extremely important and very, very interesting. So in terms of the question of whether, the, you know, where does demand come from? Is this poverty? Uh, I think that that part of the, the part of the value of the experiment is precisely that people are willing to pay more or to, you know there seems to be more um, more uh, at least responsiveness now there's other evidence on that uh, which is that you know people people uh, actually are the number of visits to a healthcare provider are higher in India for poorer people. More people go to the healthcare providers more. So yes, they, I mean, eventually they don't go to the best hospital. So that isn't, is poverty important? Of course it's important. But is it, is it the case that at the margin they could spend a bit more money or a bit less money? Um, I, my guess is yes, this is very cheap. Healthcare is very cheap. This is, this is all operating at a minimum wage. So healthcare is very cheap. Could they, con and when we, when in the experiment, uh, we do find, and that's why I'm a bit hesitating to push that because the effect is only, if you have to, you have to squint really hard to see, uh, see these, is the significant the effect is large actually the effect on price is large it's noisy um my guess is it's, it's, it's of the order of 10 percent which is roughly the order of the improvement in training so it's not not small um so i, I think people are willing to pay more and uh, they do spend a lot of money on healthcare. a huge part of of um i mean the amount of money privately spent on healthcare in india is very high uh, six percent, I think, of GDP is private spending on healthcare. Uh, so people are spending lots of money, including very poor people. That's widely been documented. Uh, what are the doctors doing when they're sitting around? They really are sitting around. And the, I think, the, to me, the more interesting question is why are they in that industry? And I think that's a result of just their absence of of good jobs, so they're really, this is a free entry industry. You enter it because you don't have anything else to do. And I have a video, a nice video for somebody saying, look, I, I qualified from high school and I had no job, so I became a doctor. It's, I think it's more the free entry aspect of it. So uh, that's related, goes back to this question of, you know, better, better certification. I, I, take, I think your point about 
longer time horizons is very well taken and you know that's sort of the discount factor in a sense uh, the discount factor if, if the discount factor is high enough then the separating equilibria are going to be at least for the high type will be not be dominated by the pooling equilibrium and so uh, absolutely on the other hand um, it depends very much on the interaction of, of that and your ability to predict whether the person will get it better or not. If you're already in a world where you're, it's pretty unpredictable, then the effective discount factor is very high because your uh, discount rate is very high because effectively you think, okay, even if I do my best, probably he won't get better and come, not come back. Then, then the incentive to, that pushes very much towards pulling. You just treat it period by period pooling is the thing you want to do. You don't worry about them coming back. So depends, I think, on how accurate you are and how confident you, you are. Uh, I don't know why the vignettes are, are why, I mean, I, I'm not saying at all in the vignettes, they respond as well as they could. They might do still be underperforming in the vignette. Maybe the knowledge is even higher. That's all I can say. Um, the question of the interpretation of motivation going up, that's in a sense what I was trying to say by saying that there is, if that's the case that basically then the way you'll attract patients is by cutting the price. And we don't see that. That's, that was exactly the point I was making is that that, that was the reason. That's a, just one of the versions of soft skills. You can call it, whatever you want, it's an increase in supply. If it's an increase in supply so that I am actually offering you better treatment at the same, uh, at a lower, uh, at the same price, then maybe maybe you'll take it. You'll say that, okay, I, I used to get three minutes for this money. Now I'm going to get five minutes for it. So therefore I'll take it. We don't see that. We don't at all see the, uh, the prices seem to have exactly the same relationship. So that's that's a sense in which I think this story is uh, has to be about demand and not about supply. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I think that improving people's outside option, I think that's a great point. I, I do think that that would help, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that the, in terms of, various, you know, of the options we have a certification, if there was not this ideological resistance, that seems like a cheaper option. Uh, one, which we, I, I'm all for giving more money to poor people. So it's, I wouldn't push back in, in, in that. Um, finally on universal healthcare. So that's a complicated question. In some sense, India has universal healthcare. The public sector is, Every village has a, a primary subcenter, a healthcare subcenter. So every village has one. Do they work well? No, they're closed 40% uh, of the time. Um, so universal healthcare, but is so it's not so much about the formal supply side. The, the formal supply side actually exists at all levels. It is more about creating the right incentive. But then the right incentives, and that's why I, I, you know, the, the work we had done with uh, Esther and Angus a long time ago uh, gets exactly into that issue. I don't know that we have a resolution of it, but we can, it's also, but one thing that's interesting is that what the government healthcare providers say is that nobody comes to us. We sit in the office day after day, and nobody comes. Now, why don't they come? Partly because they are not actually uh, allowed to treat many conditions. They're not allowed to give medicines for most children. Like in, in the US, a nurse has only a certain kind of medicine she can prescribe. So it's not, not surprising. Maybe if people have a distorted sense of what healthcare is, which is often giving, um, giving uh, injectables, then you 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 also handicap the, by insisting on proper protocols that you if a nurse is not allowed to give a shot then she's from the patient's point of view she's not delivering 
So I, I, that's this is a, this is a whole sort of complicated issues. We we have a recent paper from 2020, which is a, goes back to that data and summarizes it. And I think it's probably on on our web pages. If not, I'll put it there. Exactly going back to this question of why, what what the issue is. But I I I don't have a I don't have a I mean I think the universal healthcare question is complicated for that. Yeah, if I can just add, I, I, my thought was why don't trying to incorporate those uh, untrained and qualified into the universe? Oh, that, that, that's the regulation question. That the position is shifting, fortunately. I mean, but the, for many years, the Medical Council of India, which is the medical regulatory body, took the view that these guys are illegal and therefore they shouldn't exist. And therefore you can't then integrate them. That's shifting actually with COVID when you see the shift. So it's not, it may actually ha go in that direction of training them more integrated. Okay, so thank right. you very much. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, we don't have questions in the Q and A's yet. I do have one question. Uh, go ahead. If, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so it's about network effects, right? We know that in low trust, contexts, networks matter a lot. And even, even in rich countries, right? We use our relations mm -hmm. to find good doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't really talk about them. I mean, do, 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 does this appear in your data somehow? And would there be ways to no, harness? We, we, we don't have it. This data set has no, uh, nothing on the patient side. That's the problem. The reason I didn't talk about it is not because I don't, I think, as as uh, Roberta said, uh, almost surely uh, you is not reputation vis-a-vis -vis an individual. It's a reputation vis-a-vis -vis a cluster of people. Uh, you know, you I, I have my brother went and he had a good experience, so I came. So it's when I talk about a patient, it's really not a patient, but a, a cluster of patients who who each think that they have, you know, roughly the same preferences, etc. So I, I, I think that that's almost surely what's going on. We have no way of getting at it because the data set is completely a, a provider side data set with no information on, on patients. Right. So um, could there be a data set which was very different or one that like Roberta said, could we have done an experiment? Um, the experiment we did was we, it was done on a shoestring. The government paid for it, but on a very specific budget. So we had no money to do it, but could we have done another experiment where we shock parts of the network with reputation? Yes. I mean, I, I think these are all very interesting questions, but I don't have a, this data set, this work really doesn't uh, have any way of getting at it other than just when I use the word patient, I mean really a representative of a particular group in a, of, of patients. Thank you very much, Abhijit. Still, still no question in the Q&A. Okay. So I think we can, we can stop here. It was great okay. to have you. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks having me. Thanks again. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you for your comments. Good luck with everything. Thank you. you everybody stay well. You Take too. care. Thanks. Bye.